Grand Rounds. I'm Dave Schulman. I am here in my role as uh, chair of the Academy of Medical Educators. It's my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce, uh, now, now I'll say my good friend now because we had some yeah. good times with the last 24 hours, my good friend Dr. David Hirsch. Dr. Hirsch uh, did his undergraduate work in history at Dartmouth, went on to medical school at the University of Virginia, and then residency uh, in Michigan has been at Harvard since, where uh, he's done a lot of different things. I think the things that are coolest is he was the long-term director of a healthcare for the homeless clinic, uh, actively involved in women's health currently. But he's going to be talking about today is something that sort of blew my mind a little bit yesterday. He's going to talk about a clinical, uh, longitudinal integrated curriculum for undergraduate medical students. And this is work he's presented. This is going to be his 278th, if I'm addition is correct, uh, national or international presentation. But he's been to places, uh, most prominently, uh, many places around the country, but also East Asia, where he's presented Taiwan, Vietnam. Um, so grab your, grab your seat belts. Make sure they're buckled. You can hear some really cool things. Dr. Hirsch, the floor is yours, sir. Thanks again for coming today. Appreciate it. Forgive me, sir. All right, good afternoon, um, and welcome to those people who are viewing from the other hospitals. Uh, thank you for having me. I think um, when you are the guest, I was raised to be someone who would respect those who invited you. And so I want to make sure I say up at the front that the talk you will hear is, could be shocking or bracing or odd. There's any number of um, ways you might understand it, because it essentially is going to describe the overthrow of the classic way most all of us were trained, myself included in our core clinical year, the traditional third year. So I want to say that I'm going to present it for the purpose of just generating ideas and generating discourse and hopefully having what is the best of science after all, which is just discussions and thinking about the frontier. What I am certainly not doing and would never do is coming to sell something or say you should do this or Emory needs this. No, there's none of that. Um, one can't do that in education because education needs to be context specific. I don't know the context, so how could I possibly suggest what you would need? So I hope that you will just see this as kind of a, an odd ride through an odd idea that's actually had um, great pickup across the US and North America and Australia and beyond, I think partly because it opens up new possibilities for clinical education in undergraduate education and graduate and beyond. So let's, let us try this sort of strange notion together, and, and you can hopefully see what you think. I just want to thank the team um, back at Harvard who's working while I have the fun of being with you. And I want to make sure I know, uh, let you know I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest except for this, which is that, one, I'm delighted to be here. I had a great dinner last night, which is a warning to you all. I'm quite well rested and fed. The second is that I've led this program and developed this program, and I've led it for 15 years. So to suggest that I wouldn't have a cognitive bias or a strong sense of like how fun it is would be ridiculous. That, that's obviously something my brain has been stuck on. Um, otherwise, no conflicts. So these are examples of traditional block rotations. Some schools have seven, some have six. I just offer five here just for the simplicity of the slide. And what I want to say is that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about having a program of clinical education, the core clinical year for students, um, which does not form in this way. Rather, it's going to form in a different way, which we are going to call longitudinal integrated clerkships, a form of educational continuity. All right. So here's our quick outline. The case for change. Why make a change to the core clinical year? After all, it's been around since April of 1910. From educational sciences to a model. Once you, once you have a case for change, you have to think about what design features guided by evidence would create a model that addressed that case for change. Data. The data that would suggest that maybe we met the case for change, or maybe those sciences actually worked out in our model. And then what's next? And what's next is actually quite fun. And that's sort of the tickler for the end of the talk. All right, so first we'll look at the uh, case for change. Now, the case for change, of course, like any good talk, resides having something to do with Abraham Flexner. Um, it also has to do with this notion of ethical erosion, which I will describe, and population and workforce needs. So first, Flexner, the great Flexner report of, of 1910. So the devil will quote Flexner, of course, to serve his needs. And I intentionally tried to not do any Flexner manipulation. This is the quote from page 95 of the old green version of the bound book. To sample a school on its clinical side, one seeks continuity of service on the part of the teachers and the closeness that the student can follow individual patients. Classic Flexner. And of course, Flexner thought to do these, you must do them in a hospital. Because in 1910, all patients went to the hospital. 
this idea of having clinics was not quite the thing after um, in that in that era. If you had patients in hospitals, those patients reflected the maladies that most af afflicted the public health. Like the diseases of the public health, they were found within these hospital settings. They were admitted. Teachers were with their patients, those patients, for long periods of time, and those patients were in the hospital for long periods of time, and teachers were with their students for long periods of time. To have continuity, you'd be in a hospital. So what happened, and you know it well, the context of care is not like that anymore. I mean, the average length of stay is 2.4 days, right? And the teachers don't stay around for six months on the same ward. And after all, those who are admitted to the wards aren't necessarily those who have the conditions most afflicting the public health. I want to just whine for a moment to say that I thoroughly enjoyed my pediatric rotation. I did. It would be kind of odd to think, though, that I should have admitted a child with congenital citrullinemia three times, or that I should have met a child with osteogenesis imperfecta or Cree de Shaw. I saw these. I saw Chede Kagachi also. Here, I'm saying it. Like, I'm saying this little disease list of rare diseases. First of all, I think it's important for us to hold that we don't see diseases. We see people. Continuity gets us back towards seeing people. But second of all, though it was very meaningful to see children who were suffering and to try to intercede and help with their care, I don't think any educator would suggest that's the best way to train medical students to see the rarest of the rare things. I think first and probably foremost, we should understand the core sort of transcendent skills of doctoring and take care for the conditions most afflicting the public health. Flexner wanted that. It's hard to do that nowadays, though, because if you think about who gets admitted, it's the sort of the hyperacute and often rare conditions. Patients who deserve magnificent care, but not necessarily the patients you'd first choose to have your students learning with and for and upon. And finally, the faculty don't stay on that ward for a very long time, but neither do the students, and the faculty don't stay with their students for a very long time. There's this, this kind of idea of continuity, connection between teacher and student and student and patient is lost now in our current context. Now, I went into that more lengthily or wordily, I suppose, than one, than one might, but here's why. When you see what's forthcoming here, you're going to see a very big, different kind of education. And the first impulse one might have is, that, that's so new and strange. The entire impetus for our making the change was to get back to the core way doctors have been trained for generations and generations before the delivery system made it impossible to do it that way. We're inured now to this new delivery system, and yet our education hasn't changed. So I want to have you hold the idea that we're trying to go back towards the core thing of old to animate those values of old in this new model. Ethical erosion, I'll do quickly. What is ethical erosion? So it was defined by a 1994 paper by Feutner, Christakis, and Christakis, where they used this term ethical erosion. What they really meant was the decline or the harm to professionalism. It's not really ethics. I'll show one page of data from the paper. The paper is quite bracing and upsetting, but I think the one page will make enough of a clarification of the problem. In this page, um, we see one of the many uh, results pages from the 665 students who were surveyed at the six Eastern Pennsylvania medical schools in uh, 1994. Here you find the number of students, the percent of students, um, who heard derogatory comments about their patients. Not who heard swearing or kind of rough language or you know, anger, but who heard specifically directed language against the patient. That patient is a mm hmm. 98% of students reported that was their experience from working on house officer led. It's a room full of house officers, I get it, and students, I understand. But house officer led inpatient block teams. Now I'm not saying this is Emory. I'm not saying this goes on to the, to the same degree today. But interestingly, in 1994, it was quite a thing. 98% of, of students experienced these derogatory comments towards patients. And it does invite the question, like, what percent would be OK there, right? I mean, should it be 75% of students hear derogatory comments or 42%? That's a problem. But it's not as big as this problem. The 32% of students who reported feeling like an accomplice to a crime as a consequence of working on those ward teams back in 1994. Now we can say, even though we look at this page and the next page and the next page, there were data upon data that showed similarly upsetting experiences of students. We can dispute the study altogether, but what it did was it launched this term, ethical erosion, and a bunch of studies that followed. So here's the quick ride through the ones that followed. Paul Haydet and colleagues used a validated tool looking at patient-centeredness and found that students decline in their patient-centeredness in medical school, most notably in their core clinical year. 
a series of authors used a series of different validated tools that look at empathy and show that students decline in their empathy in medical school and most notably in their core clinical year. Wow, oh, these tools are validated in medicine. How valid are they? What, what is patient-centeredness after all? All right. Students decline in their moral development in medical school, most notably in their core clinical year, on the most validated tool in social psychology, Lawrence Kohlberg's DIT scale. They declined in their moral development compared to age match peers, and the clinical year was the core, the cliff of that. Yeah, you know, but you know, this happens probably in all health professions or in all graduate schools. No, actually, it happens in medical school, not other professional schools. Uh, Danielle Bebo and others have shown that um, if you look at other professional schools, including those that do health education, they don't have the problem, but medical education does. Ah, yeah, I know, but they'll get better. They'll bounce back. They're resilient. No, it turns out, actually, that when bad things happen to you in medical school, bad things happen thereafter by you. And a series of authors in a series of trials in the early years and since have shown that. Okay, we can reject ethical erosion altogether, but the point I'm trying to make is it bothered us. It bothered us that we weren't following Flexner. It bothered us that we had this ethical erosion thing plausibly happening. Those to us were cases for change. I offer the ethical erosion picture here because I think sometimes far better than giving like little, uh, little data, uh, data slides or paper reviews, you, uh, an image makes more power. So in this particular photo, I was giving a talk like this um, in Stellenbosch in South Africa and I'm going down the street and I pause, I pull out my camera and I lift it to my eyes and my wife, who's, a, who's an actual real educator, not just some kind of like crack medical educator, she's a real educator. She puts her, ha her hand on her head like this and says, no, 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 no. Please tell me you're not seeing a metaphor for ethical erosion here. I said, I am seeing a metaphor for ethical erosion here. Right? You see the verdant flowers, the, the verdant green in the flowers, and they're bound by the razor wire. And I, I got sort of the, the, the knowing head shake and the, the look. But anyway, it does work for me as a metaphor for ethical erosion um, that we should do better by our students than binding them up like this. All right population and workforce needs. So there's a, another problem in our healthcare delivery system. The, the, remember, after all, our delivery system is the output of our medical schools and residencies. One is that we have greatly underserved geographic locations, often rural and remote, but, but you know, mountain areas, other areas that are further, further uh, abroad um, in this country, and certainly even far more in Canada, Australia, and in places that have remote um, uh, regions, there are not enough physicians. But even in areas that have enough physicians, there are underserved specialties. So specialties that don't exist in the right numbers, even in areas that have plenty of doctors. Or there even are places where it's not geographically underserved, and the specialty disciplines are the broad swath of what we'd expect to have, except certain populations don't have the care they need. And I know this is well known to you all, certainly our, our colleagues at Grady who are watching alongside here. Um, but finally, there are underserved missions. Right? And foremost among them may actually be science. If we look at the leak rate of people who do MD, PhDs, and how many of them continue to do biomedical research, it's very few among the entrants to PhD programs, MD, PhD programs. And science itself, strangely, um, is, is not something that, that has been uh, continued uh, um, from graduates of medical schools. So what are we doing that's deterring people who join medical science fields, medical school, from doing science subsequently? Indeed, there's other things like quality and safety, underserved care, social accountability. You can make your list of underserved missions that schools are not doing. Um, suffice it to say, there's plenty of population and workforce needs. All right. In short, stuff bothered us. We had a case for change. So we thought, okay, what can we do? Maybe we can do something to address that case for change. So that got us to what principles should underpin the solution, what educational sciences should lead us to a model. Here's where it gets nutty. We had a framework we called the continuity framework, or educational continuity. It linked to John Dewey. It linked to Flexner. After all, continuity of care. That's relinking the faculty up to the student with their patient. Remember Flexner, the closeness the student should follow their individual patient? Or continuity of supervision. That's the connectedness between the faculty person and the student. Again, from Flexner. And we had these sort of cheesy ways we would describe it. I mean, kind of absurd. You know, there's always a need for these cheesy frameworks when you're going through a change. So we did it this way. Continuity of care. The student needs to matter to their patient. The patient needs to matter to their student. Continuity of curriculum. The student needs to matter to the curriculum. The curriculum needs to matter to the student. Of supervision. The student needs to matter to their teachers. The teachers need to matter to their student. 
my buddies were saying like, oh yeah, like, like you're gonna get one for idealism. Just because I'm, 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 annoyingly, I'm annoyingly like this, I said, yeah, yeah, the student needs to matter to the future, and the future needs to matter to the students. So anyway, we have whole, a whole framework by which we think stuff has to matter again, and it has to matter through connectedness. But see, that's all cute, but behind this, and importantly behind this, are the sciences of learning, the learning sciences. And we use three core learning sciences to create that continuity framework, which we published in the New England Journal. So I'm going to describe the learning sciences, because away from pithy slogans and uh, cute frameworks, there's actually important things that lead us to models here. So first, we'll start with relationships. There's tons of educational theorists who have written about and thought about relationships as a foundational way that learning happens, from the original architect of American um, education of K through 12, John Dewey, the great philosopher, and Carl Rogers, who nearly won the Nobel Prize based on his work on relationships, Bandura, the architect of social learning theory, and Noddings with feminist learning theories, Keegan with adult, adult development learning theories, and Lave and Wenger, Lav and Wenger, with situated learning theory, and Billet with workplace learning. There's plenty of theories, but I'm, I'm not promising you theories. I'm promising you educational science, and it goes like this. Bandura and the work of Martin Seligman, the one who looked at learned helplessness, led us to Carol Dweck, her work being greatly popularized lately with the book Mindset. But I'm going to try to bend you away from the book Mindset towards the book called Self Theories. Um, I think this is one book ago. The new one's purple or pink. Um, this is the book that summarizes in sort of um, highly accessible writing, short chapters and very accessible writing, the hard science um, of the learning and resilience theories of Dweck perhaps the foremost social psychologist of our time, or of any time, really. So I just want to, I want to laud her loudly. And I'm going to explain to you um, the notion of, of Dweck's work. Um, first, I want you to think about how a person can have an influence on another person's learning, and how that, that, those influences are kind of dyadic, relational. But ultimately, we think of teacher-student kind of like this. But of course, there's also this, right? A teacher can teach a student to be autonomously functioning better. That's the goal, ultimately, right? So how do we think about this through the lens of the educational science? I'm going to tell a quick story about Dweck. And if you've not heard the story before, I think you'll find this to be something kind of, I don't know, important and shocking. I'm going to use the language of the research itself. This is language which um, does not attend to our notions of gender currently in, in our world. Um, it's quite binary, the language the researchers use. But here's how they described it. They looked at, quote, boys and girls, to use their language, uh, in the classroom. These are like um, seven-year-olds, seven, eight-year-olds. If you look at the girls, they were outperforming the boys greatly. They were doing better at their work. They were more successful. They were getting more praise, more feedback, bigger feedback. Look at the boys. They're kind of like a pack of squirrels, right? You can't keep them in the seat. If they stayed in the seat, it was a good day. The boys aren't accomplishing as much. You know, they're, they're not getting as much feedback. The feedback is much more um, diminished. So they gave the children problems they could not solve. And what happened was is the girls quit. I can't do this. I'm so stupid. I'm not good at math. And the boys didn't quit, strangely. So it was upsetting and also not clear why this was happening. So the researchers then, because uh, they were good researchers, they, they empirically watched and watched. And they realized the teachers were doing something like this. Laura, outstanding, to someone who was female. To someone who was male, they'd say, Dave, keep it up, buddy. like the way you're working hard there. The girls got nouns, they got big nouns, and the noun is plausibly either about the person themselves or about the work. It was kind of unclear. Whereas the boys got verbs, they got process stuff about what I was actually doing, dissociated from me, me the person. So they switched over how the faculty, how the teachers gave the feedback, keeping the feedback at the appropriate level to the learner's actual ability, but giving the feedback more noun-like to the boys and more process-like to the girls. And what happened was the effect switched over and the boys quit, I'm so stupid, I can't do this. And the girls hung in, ah, oh, I can't figure this out. There's a problem. I can't figure this out. And that led to many, many years from the mid-'80s on where Dweck and her great graduate students together figured out that people hold what's called implicit theories or self-theories. That is, they have notions about how they learn. And the two famous ones we, we talk about now, it's up in the lay press, the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. So I, I could give an entire talk on this topic, and I do love the topic, but the bottom line is it matters a lot how we understand our own learning. That can be fostered by others, and feedback, the way it happens, matters a lot. And these relational connections make feedback more possible and more impactful. So that was interesting to us. We thought we could redesign education and medicine to, to uh, use that power. 
All right, if you think that was hairy, the longitudinal here is going to get kind of completely nuts. Here's the review paper. There's many great uh, basic science of education papers that went into this paper that I would uh, direct you to, but just for simplicity, I used this one. When we say longitudinal, or like longitudinal integrated clerkship, which I'll show you in a moment, that's actually in the learning literature called spacing learning or spaced learning. And the word integration means interleaving, like pages of a book or a deck of cards, like that, interleaving. So spacing learning um, is basically this. Now, you have to watch this one kind of carefully, guys, because the next page has a three-dimensional graph, which is just mean to do to new friends. But I can get you through the three-dimensional graph if I show you this carefully. Imagine that there's some material you're trying to learn. Then there's a space in time, the study gap, before you relearn that material, either the same way or in some other way. And there's another space in time between when you ultimately use that material. It could be a test. Or like in medicine, it could be the test of life. Like if you learn how to do a central line, and then six months later, you have to actually do a central line. That's kind of your test, right? You got to do it well, um, in fact, perfectly. So there's a, there's a time between when you ultimately learn something and when you sort of need to know it or need to use it or are tested upon it. So this, the test delay, is one of the spaces, one of the three axes of the next creepy curve you're going to see. The study gap is another one of the axes of the curve you're going to see on the next page. Those are two of the three. The third thing is how well one retains what they learned. So here's how, no, warning, here's how it goes. Three arrows. The test delay, the time between when you learn something finally and ultimately had to apply it. The study gap, the time between learn and relearn. The test score, how much you retained or how able you were, how much you held on to. You go up to the Northeast up here, where no doubt it's raining in Boston up there. Um, in the Northeast, that's a time of very short test delay. It means you basically studied something, and shortly thereafter, you, had to, you took the test, or shortly thereafter, you used the skill you just learned. Right? So with a very short test delay, there's a whole lot retained. The, the most of the literature on all sorts of things, from art appreciation and music appreciation and poetry and math and science and all English, whatever, language, shows that most people hold on to about 90% of what they learn soon thereafter, and then they lose it quickly in the next week. So here's how this looks. Up there, short test delay. Your test score is high. It doesn't make a whole bunch of difference at all whether you space the learn and relearn because you're already holding on to so much. Here's where it gets dark. If you put a test delay of even one month in, there's a substantial drop in how much is, ma is retained from what you originally learned. Right? What is that? 15%, 20%, right? So what if the test delay is longer, though? What if the test delay is like out a year? And it's possible to learn something in med school you don't use into your internship or something in internship you don't use into your third year of residency, plausibly, right? So a year test delay happens sometimes in medicine, certainly between school and training. Mm, right, so I, I joke often that like, no matter how bad this talk is I give today, it's fine because a year from now you won't even recognize me, right? <laughs> so it's perfect, right? So something, something clearly is wrong with the way, way we're doing learning when a test delay causes this much loss of what we learned. But you'll notice here, here we can add the study gap, the space between learn and relearn. You learn something, there's some time spent, you learn it again, and if you do, you get back up on the curve. And you'll notice then that red line, which I'll, make, I'll highlight so we can see it, that line right there. That red line, or green line, is the height of the curve, the highest height of the curve. It's the most you can hold on to or retain for any amount of test delay. All right, whatever, it's not so interesting. But I tried to bend the green arrow to make the bigger point, which is this. The longer out the test delay, the further out it is that you actually have to know the thing from when you last learned it, the more study gap you need. So what does that mean if you've got a one-month rotation where you learn something over one month? There's not enough time to relearn that material the same way again to maximize your one's retention. You notice if you space things too much, the waning of the curve doesn't have as much of a loss. But if you don't space enough, the cliff is on the close side. So spacing more is actually the better error to make than spacing less. All right. That is the painful ride through spacing learning. Interleaving, the next one, is so much easier. Just don't forget study gap. Interleaving, or integrated. It just means this. We could block by type. Math, 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 English, 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 Mandarin, Mandarin, Mandarin. One course, then the next, then the next. Or we could do multiple things simultaneously. We could interleave. 
math, English, Mandarin, English, math, English, Mandarin, math, English, right? Multiple things simultaneously. Now, this is not unfamiliar to you, right? We, when we were in secondary school, we took multiple courses simultaneously, K through 12. In fact, even in law school or business school, they have longer courses that are multiple things simultaneously. We don't do this so much in medicine, right? So let's just look at what happens. If you test immediately after, it's kind of like the up northeast corner there, the upper corner of the curve we saw a moment ago, block learning is about 90%. People hold on to many things. Cramming works. If you want to study for the test, you can cram. In the spacing literature, you saw the way upper right green ball. Cramming worked with the test delay is short. Here you see again. You do block cramming, cramming works for the test. Not for life, but it works for the test. If you want to hold on longer than just for the test, maybe even, I don't know, a week later, you see interleave learning persists far better than block. And this has, again, been shown across many different domains of learning, from skill-based to knowledge-based, across disparate things like from math to music and art and so forth. If you space and interleave, the effect is even higher. They actually um, they benefit each other. So I do the same thing because I like making these obnoxious sounds because they remember the big problem, which is this. Right? We lose a lot with block, just like we lose a lot when we don't space. So we have now attended to each of the learning sciences that helped underpin our model, right? These, after all, were behind that. So let's put this back where it was. We had the sciences, we had the framework, and that got us to a new model of clinical education grounded in those educational sciences you just saw. And that thing is called the Longitudinal Integrated Clerkship. Now, I call it an LIC. Across most of America, we say LIC. I'll tell you the Aussies and the Canadians call them LICs, but we're much more refined here, so we're going to go with LIC. Um, I'll, later at the, end, at the very end of the talk, which is forthcoming, we'll all, you'll see how much penetration has happened across North America and the world with this model. What is the model? Well, we know the old model. I promised you that at the beginning. There's block rotations, which we've all done, which we all are doing probably even as we speak for some of us. All right, I did them too. And all we're saying is this. Same disciplines, same amount of disciplines, same intensity, same high standards, but just longitudinal and integrated, or spaced and interleaved. To which you could say, that's ridiculous. Like, well, how could you possibly do that? That doesn't even seem sensible on its face. To which I will say, well, how about this? We wouldn't do math for eight weeks and then no more math ever again. And then English for eight weeks and no more English and no more math ever again. And we could do biology for eight weeks and no more biology. Like, we wouldn't do this. Like, who would do this? Well, I, I don't know. We did this throughout our entire childhood. Who would do that? Well, I guess we would do that. Right? So one of the questions is, could we get away with trying a longitudinal integrated scheme like they do in so many other parts of education outside of medicine, and it, would it work? So that was the risk we took. I happen to love this discipline. I loved it for the last 26 years. Um, I loved it when I, we did work in the homeless program. I love it now that I work uh, in the Women's Center. So I'm going to pick the discipline I love. So if we looked at what, no, I want to say one thing. There's all these other disciplines that are going to do the same thing that I'm going to show you. Now I'm just going to show you an example from one of the disciplines. Internal medicine as a stream, right? The black things you see there are inpatient, inpatient, inpatient. That's what we normally understand. That's how our normal training goes, right? We're in the hospital and the inpatients come in. So it was fun to think about this through the lens of surfing. And we're not surfing outside Atlanta too, too soon, I suspect. Um, although maybe sooner than we, than we realize. But um, imagine this. If you want to know what surfing is all about, you take your board, you walk into the water with your board, and you stand there, and the waves go by you, one wave after the next. That's like being on an inpatient ward, right? One patient after the next comes by you. But I think we could ask ourselves whether that's actually feeling the wave. Is that really surfing? With surfing, you have to paddle out there, you hop up on the board, you get on the wave, and you ride the wave to shore. You know the fullness and the power of the wave. So we're going to use the metaphor to show you the difference between the, the little black things here where you see inpatient, inpatient, and this. Imagine a structured cohort of internal medicine patients carefully chosen, and a preceptor whose patients those are, and a student who together with the preceptor will care for those patients over time. Right? You can make a deliberately, intentionally diverse mix of patients and of conditions, Right? So you don't have the situation like, like I had, where I, <laughs> I had admitted, um, the, again, to, I'll use the pediatric example, this patient with congenital citral anemia three times in pediatrics, but I had not seen a single failure to thrive. I had not seen a single fever in a newborn or fever in a two-month-old or fever in an adolescent. I had not seen a single uh, ear infection run amok into mastoiditis or pneumonia or diabetes or, or, or all these common things I hadn't seen. 
So we can make a deliberate cohort that are the core things that the senior internists here or nationally would say, like those are the things students have to know fundamentally to understand internal medicine before they learn the other things too. You see, and you can follow those patients across all venues of care. Because after all, um, I'll give you the example. This is, a real this is the beginning of a real cohort of one of the patients, of, sorry, of one of the students. The patient with weight loss, you notice, was only admitted at the end of the year. So that patient was diagnosed with cancer, and the students saw that patient in internal medicine, and then saw the patient in their pre-op, in the OR, in the post-op, back to internal medicine, to hemonc multiple times, and radonc, and, and to the psychiatry visits that were needed, and multiple times to the ED. So that internal medicine patient, oh, is that an internal medicine patient, or is that a surgery patient? Or is that, there is no such thing as an internal medicine patient. They're just a patient. They're just people. But there is a disciplines approach to caring for people, and that matters. So we want to we wanna regard highly the approach to patients that disciplines bring while understanding the patient as the organizing principle and allowing for cross-venue following, which much more animates the true experience of the patient and also how the disease unfolds over time and how decisions we make actually play out. You can see what happens when you chose that wrong antibiotic. I'm, I'm pandering since there's infectious disease doctors all around me. Um, all right. And you can run into all sorts of other faculty and consultants along the way. All right. How does it look? I show you one week. This is one page of a 52-week book, 52-page book. And here you see the different disciplines on different half days. And imagine the student will go to neurology most every Monday morning for the whole year. That student's seeing her neurology patients with her neurology preceptor in that neurology clinic. And when those patients are admitted, the student can go with them. And you see the same for the other disciplines. And they've got they have some didactics where they work on clinical reasoning and um, they do all sorts of um, evidence-based medicine, journal club type stuff. And they go to radiology and paths sometimes. You've changed some of these things a little bit over the years. And there's blue space for the students to follow their patients longitudinally. Anyway, I can tell you much more about this. There's a ton of surgery in this too, which you don't see here because the ORs, the ORs are, like if neuro is three out of four weeks, the other one might be the operating room. Right, so there's all sorts of ORs all throughout behind these. Anyway, we can talk more about the schedule, but I wanted to more just say there is a schedule. It's makeable. It works. Students like it. It's crazy making. So let's just think about this for a second, you students in the room who are about to go like this. All right? How many of you speak a second language? Excellent. Does anybody speak a third language? Excellent. Right, would, you, would you feel safe offering the, what languages you speak? Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So... Interesting to think. So how many people spoke a third language since they were a child? We'll, we'll count it. All right. So children who learn three or more languages at once have a speech delay. But if they keep going with the three languages, they eventually catch up in each of the three languages, unsurprisingly. But that's not the interesting thing about the human brain. There's much more interesting things, which is you take, for example, an English, German, and Mandarin speaker, right? And you try to teach them Russian, the three-language learner actually can learn that fourth language far more easily than a two-language learner or a single-language learner, right? And if you do a population of people like this. So it's that not just that they now have three languages. That's a, that's a gift in its own right. It's that they actually are better at language generally. Interleaving has a big benefit. Our students do not like having multiple languages simultaneously. It's a J-shaped curve. They actually like our program less, and they feel less competent, and they are less competent in the early part of our year, like the speech delay metaphor. But at the end of the year, the data show not only do they love it more, but the data are quite compelling about um, how well they do. So that's what I'm going to go to next. That's crazy making early on. That's highly, it's a high affordance later on. They're also better self-organizers and find that valuable too. The data are these. I'm just going to show you the data from, from several, I mean, there's many more papers, but I'm going to show you some of the Harvard data from the early years because it's, it's the easiest to demonstrate the points. Um, there's the intervention group, the Cambridge Integrated Clerkship, or CIC. There's the comparison group, COM. The way it worked was that many more students applied to our program than there were spots. So we randomly chose the students into our program, and the other students became the comparison group, basically. Um, I can tell you much more about these groups, but the important thing to suggest is this. There's no difference between the two groups, between either group and the rest of the class, or between the combined groups and the rest of the class. Right? And we could find no differences um, between the two groups across a wide array of things. I'm only going to show you the ones that you're most likely to ask me, the previous MCATs, they're part one of the boards, they're second year OSCE, patient-centered care preferences, future practice choices, the gender, age, on and on, that we could find no differences among or between. 
did we make the program that we said we were going to make? So how often have you been involved in seeing patients you've treated before their initial diagnosis and decision to admit? You see the blue um, is the Cambridge group and the maroon is the um, comparison group. And it was far, far more likely, you see the p-value, that the Cambridge students saw patients before admission and after discharge, right? Now, you should say, of course, you get no credit for that. You made a model that does this. I, I agree, I agree. I'm not saying this is laudatory or even good. I'm just saying that we at least tried to make a model that did this, and it seems like we made a model that did this. Not that there's any important, you know, that's it. But was it relational? You know, this whole relational thing I just pitched you for a while. How often have you been involved in seeing, uh, in establishing relationships with patients you'd call meaningful? And you see, you see the difference. Also interesting, 100% of the students um, said very often or often to this in the, in the intervention group. We also asked, how often have you been involved in um, feeling you made a real difference in the care of patients? It was also a P of less than 0.05. Um, so okay, so again, no credit to the, to, to the program. We just, it seems like we just did what we promised. It was relational, longitudinal, and integrated to some degree. Now, you would say, like, look, I, I want to see board scores immediately or else this conversation has to end. So here's the, here's the shelf scores and the board scores. Um, all right. The, if I made a single bar where I said sum of tests, Cambridge comparison P, that would be less than 0.02 for the difference. But that seems, like, uncool to, like, hide stuff by aggregating. So I pulled them out. We did four shelves back, four shelf exams back then. Here are the four exams. There are the uh, four P values. I pulled them out as far as I could so you would see the real numbers. Um, and you see in two of the disciplines there was no difference. You see in two of the disciplines there appears to be a difference. And you see that the lean was always towards Cambridge. And then you should say, nope, 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 you're still aggregating. You're hiding data because actually it was three years and four shelf exams. You should show us 12 bars. Okay. So nine of the bars favored Cambridge and three of the bars were in the margin of error. There were no bars that favored the comparison group. Okay. Board scores. So after three years, you see the, the Cambridge was the top. You see the comparison is the next. You see the, the lean towards Cambridge, but not at all, not significant. Now, one year later, it turns out the P was less than 0.05, to which you should say, no, no, no. You do not show, you don't give us four years of data on a three-year trial. That's completely cheating and even obnoxious to say it out loud. That's not why I'm doing it. What I'm doing is to say this. Those P values went down over time. There was no early effect from the first class. It wasn't that the first class was great. The next two classes had no difference. The bigger the N got, the lower the P got. And the effect sizes for these things were at a level of um, 0.5 up to like 1.3, 1.4. So these, they're, they're, they're real differences. So to here, I just mentioned the P value being less than 0.05 a year later to suggest that it wasn't from the first class being great and the other classes having no difference. There's the make or break um, comprehensive OSCE. Harvard students have to pass to get out of the school. Although I must tell you, Harvard students like never leave the school. They stay for so long. But um, I think more than half the students stay uh, five years or more. Um, anyway, there is the test. Less than 0.05 for the difference. And no year did the comparison group outperform um, the Cambridge group ever, actually, in the history of the um, OSCE, 16 years since. But Cambridge is so nice and friendly. Maybe it's just that. You're just being so nice to your students. Now, it turns out they found it more hectic and more stressful, and we're equally likely to call it frustrating, but less boring, more satisfying, more humanizing, more rewarding, less marginalizing, more confidence building, and more transformational. Why do students say transformational? Like, who says that about their core clinical year? We wish we would, but it's kind of an unusually uh, grand uh, claim. I think it's interesting to suggest more hectic and more stressful, and yet all those other positives. I had twins. My wife had twins years ago. Um, it was more hectic and more stressful and probably equally frustrating, if I confess, um, but definitely more satisfying and more rewarding and more humanizing and so forth. So when our stresses are aligned with our values, we have experiences we like. When our stresses oppose our values, not so much. So I, I worry about the comparison group. I only have three more little pages like this, and then we're into the future. We also asked them, did you feel ready to do this or that? Did you feel ready to be truly caring or deal with ethical dilemmas, understand the social context, involve patients in decision making, relate well to a diverse population? There's a whole bunch more. Understand the healthcare system page after page. In every one of them, um, but one, the students um, favored and felt more able. But that doesn't mean they were more able. They just felt good about those things. They, whether they were better, I don't know. They did not feel more able to work in inpatient environments. 
which is important because we all celebrate and value that, myself strongly included. So the question is, when they went off to their subsequent fourth year, did they perform less well? Did they do less well on part two of the boards? Did they do less well in matching and high-intensity residencies? No. They did it equally well on their fourth year sub-internships, on their electives, uh, in matching into intense uh, high-level residencies, and in part two and part three of the boards. And were equally actually slightly better at matching and slightly better uh, in the views of the residency directors. Um, so they didn't feel as well for inpatient venues, but they actually performed well. Um, we've worked since to have them feel better about it. But here's the big thing. I didn't promise HMS, none of us promised HMS, Harvard Medical School, that we would actually do better on shelf exams or whatever, and we're not even sure that we did. We did promise we would do better, though, on patient-centeredness and these kind of things. And so we used the validated tool for patient-centeredness that always historically showed a decline. And in our case, it actually showed an increase, and it became significant at the end of the year. To which you should say, yeah, these pre-post tests, what are they worth? Did it really sustain itself? Were they more patient-centered in the future? So although we see this nice change from beginning to end of year, I'm going to take this whole graph and put it to the left of the next graph. You see the same? I just pasted it over there to the left. So four to six years later, we actually did the same study again. But we didn't just do the same study again and thankfully found that they were remaining patient-centered. Who knows what path they took in between? It's certainly not a straight line. But not only did they stay apparently patient-centered with this validated tool, but what's interesting was we asked them, how satisfied are you with your learning environment, the mentorship you got, with your residency training? We asked nine domains, and in all nine domains, they were negative. In all nine domains, the comparison group was negative, and there was no difference between the comparison group and the Cambridge group about their dissatisfaction with all sorts of parts of their training. But they were more patient-centered, apparently, if you believe the validity of the tool. So it wasn't Pollyanna. They weren't just sort of giddy, cute, happy people. They were kind of grouchy people that were acting kind towards patients, maybe. We don't know what it's worth. We did a series of qualitative studies since, and other schools have reproduced it and found the same, and they all seem to align with this notion. But I still want to hold out for the fact that we don't know all yet about what's going on here. I promised you a bunch of things at the beginning, like workforce and benefits for faculty and things like this. If you look around the globe, there's all sorts of data that, su that support other benefits. We can get into these on a later date if you want. But the last one I thought you'd find interesting, which is there's benefits um, into residency. So that's why I showed you that last one. Or apparently there are. So here's the last thing I thought you'd find kind of fun. So we've had this long drumbeat of, odd, of an odd model that seems new and weird. Where does it bring us? Well, the med schools of the past were these two plus two med schools, two years basic science, two years clinical science, right? But as you start to break out of your way of thinking, what happens is you can start to make new models. So there are now med schools, right, that are doing one plus three models, right, where there's much more sort of clinical and science uh, connectivity uh, throughout, even models where they have clinical science and basic science blended throughout the entire course. So... One of the nice things about just exposing this to you, even if you would say that it's anathema to our worldview, is that the mere fact of sort of playing with ideas tends to generate new ideas. It's the best part of science after all, isn't it? I mean, all the scientists in the room know this. Like, you get to push and pull with the possibility, and you can see new things. I'm not claiming that longitudinal clerkships have led directly to this movement, but a lot of the schools that do LICs are the same ones that tested out other models of structuring the whole school, including this movement towards the end of time. The end of time means, should it be that I spend six weeks, let's say, in psychiatry and therefore are deemed being able at psychiatry? Or should I actually just be good at psychiatry enough at a student level to be deemed good at psychiatry? The idea is that time itself is not the actual arbiter. Ability is the actual arbiter. And of course, this has led to this great competency-based medical education movement and the use of EPAs and all this stuff. So a lot of the LIC people are the same people who have pushed this idea of, can we find a way to advance students through school, or maybe through school into residency even, through their ability as being the arbiter, not through time in seat or time in rotation? And this is the, a great test of that idea, the so-called EPAC, um, Education in Pediatrics Across the Continuum, or EPAC. I'm going to blow it up so we can actually see it. So AAMC um, has a program now at four schools, that's Utah, Colorado, Minnesota, and UCSF, where students flow from their longitudinal designed curriculum in med school into the residency at the same school. And they can flow in earlier. They can get more advanced skills earlier. They had to actually change California law to do this um, it, by their ability rather than just by time in seat. 
So EPAC is actually kind of a breakout notion that builds upon this idea of longitudinal design and, um, and the end of time. And it was also sponsored by the Josiah Macy Foundation. And I just thought it was kind of fun because it was sponsored by Macy, the slide I had a long time ago. And there's George Tebow, who actually started our academy. And I get to you know, hang out with his name sometimes. Um, residencies are also doing it. So the, the classic, the, the, the just brilliant work at the University of Cincinnati by Eric Warman and colleagues has developed a longitudinal integrated core year in the middle of an internal medicine residency. Um, I should just tell you, like, we, we need to do one more disclosure. Like, you can get speakers like this, which is, you know, I don't know, it's kind of middling. You want to get a great speaker? Invite Eric Warm to come down. The guy is absolutely splendid. And the program is amazing. He has so many education skills. He's an internist to the tooth, and you would like him. So I'm not pitching the integrated clerkship. I am pitching Eric Warm. All right. A longitudinal integrated residency now. So that also arose out of the same movement. All right. We're going to close with this. So you leave some time for questions. So in 2011-12, we made, we made the graph with pins. It, I don't know, any of you ever do this? I need somebody young to help me. It is so annoying to stick these pins on the map. But in 11-12, this was the longitudinal clerkships around the world. There's a few missing. Um, but it more than doubled in the five years that followed, and it's been increasingly uh, increasing even since at a high rate. And when you see a pin, don't think that's just like one longitudinal integrated clerkship. What you should see, here's Ireland, for example. When you see Ireland up there in the red, it's this, actually. That's the number of longitudinal clerkships around Ireland. So. Um, you know, you see a pin there, but you're, what you actually see is a whole country covered in these programs. So that's interesting. They're growing fast. They're growing in North America and around the world, and you see so far where. Um, but here's what's interesting. 40% of the U.S. now, 40% of U.S. medical schools are engaged in longitudinal integrated clerkship design. It's 45%. It's just nearly 50 in Australia, and it's over 50 in Canada. So it's quite taken off. It's not... I'm not, please hear me, I'm not saying it fits every context or it would even fit this context. I just think it's important to realize that there's something going on uh, with these principles that is just, it's worth playing with intellectually. It just sort of helps us think about what we can do to educate our students in our context. But we've got to close academically, I have to tell you. So governments around the world are very into in integrated clerkships and um, where governments fund education. In the US, we, we thought we were hearkening to the IOM. So among all the academic health center roles, education will require the greatest changes in the coming decade. We regard education as one of the primary mechanisms for initiating a cultural shift towards an emphasis on the needs of patients and populations and a focus on improving health using the best of science and the best of caring. So it was our charge. You can see the date was 2003. And they say the coming decade. And I, I'm happy to think that a lot of cool things happen in education in that decade and since. And I hope that just the, the playing with ideas here together today will give you the chance to keep on meeting your highest ideals. So thank you for inviting me. That was great, David. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we'll open it up to questions, but I have one. And maybe there's a bias in my question. Was there an influence on residency choice yeah, uh, by the students uh, to primary care yeah. kind of activity? So first of all, thank you. And, and you have to ask that question. I think that's extremely important. So you use LICs to do the mission you seek. So there are schools that specifically make LICs to do rural health or rural generalists or primary care or whatever they seek or to do like the health for the state of South Dakota. We did not do that. And, and I, it'll amuse you to realize how it is that we couldn't possibly do that. Harvard Medical School said, you will turn out graduates that look just like our graduates. They will be, for, forgive me for the like, oh, so Harvard rhetoric here. It's like the classic word. Do you know what I'm going to say? We're going to turn out leaders. Um, they love the word leaders. We're going to turn out leaders. And they'll be scientists. They'll be academicians. They will choose all the specialties. So what's happened is that's what the data show, that we, they have all the disciplines that, uh, that other um, students at HMS have. It's interesting, though, in any given year, that's not the case. So we have years when you have like, you know, primary care for a couple of years, then psychiatry for a year, then surgery for several years. We had a rad onk burst, right? But if you add it all together, there's been no evidence of any kind of trend towards a particular discipline or type of program, like community programs or something like that. Maybe I could ask a question while we're waiting on the mic. Um, so I'm an infectious disease consultant. 
when, and I love to work with medical students on our rotation. And generally, although there's, uh, there are times in the infectious disease clinic where we have students, but generally that's an inpatient time. Yes, yes. Um, so how would an infectious disease consultant get to teach medical students? And would it be only just if one of their long-term patients had an infectious disease, or how would that happen? Yes, because, partly because I was just trying to sort of generate the ideas and I throw some data at you. I didn't show many, many nuances of that schedule. So they definitely have um, blocked time in inpatient venues. They start the year doing some blocked time at inpatient venues. They come back to inpatient surgery for a week here and then a week there and medicine for a week here and a week. So there, there is inpatient time. And they all, with certainty, they all are, they're seeing the sickest of the sick patients because that's what their preceptors give them. Right? And there are core things that afflict the public health that are in the domain of infectious disease and you know, renal and pulmonary and, and, and. So they're given an intentionally diverse sample of patients wherein they have to then follow patients across to specialists serially. Right? So the, the real cool thing is the first impulse, I think that the first impulse is to ask that question. I, I agree. And that the other first impulse might be to ask this question. And here's what's interesting. It's the difference between teaching a student and teaching my student, right? Because when you're with her for the year of caring for that sick patient, that's not just having my, my one month on or my six months on that are disparately placed or you know, having the students on the team that week or those weeks. You have those students that year, right? And you have the chance for them to do not well and then do better by your own, by your own guidance, right? And for them to fumble and bumble with you because they're not afraid to fumble and bumble so they can get better because they can be themselves. And it's not so make or break when they're first hanging out with you. You're not teaching a student. You're teaching your student, right? So yes, you have them in inpatient settings. And yes, you have them not in inpatient settings as you co-follow chronically ill patients for long periods of time. Yeah. I just want to forget. Was there, oh, you, here you are? Okay. I didn't know. I, I spent it. Yeah. So the definition of primary care is it is accessible, longitudinal, and comprehensive. It seems almost as though you created a relationship between your student and their patients, which is like a primary care physician. But I wanted to probe that a little bit yes. in the sense that they have patients in OBGYN, yes. uh, et cetera, psychiatry, and so forth. Do they consider themselves to be involved in the comprehensive care of those patients as well? Yes. Or do they only concentrate no. on the specialty? No, exactly. So every patient they see does not end up being in their longitudinal panel. That Many times, they're at, like a neurology clinic, you'll see a patient once and maybe never see them again. So sometimes during their days, they're just seeing patients that they only see once. Or in the inpatient, they only see for that week. There are many, many patients, though, who they meet in one venue who they carry into other venues. So we've had some incredibly powerful ones, like the, the student who was pictured in the opening slide, Carolyn Casey, who's a gynecologic oncologist in Pittsburgh now. So she picked up a patient in neurology clinic who had these headaches that wouldn't get better. It turns out the patient was pregnant and had protein S deficiency. So she was following that neuro patient. I put it in quotes because is that a neuro patient or a heme patient or an OBGYN patient? Like she followed that patient throughout multiple neuro episodes, heme episodes, multiple ED bleeding episodes, and through the, labor, uh, through the pregnancy, labor, delivery, and saw the child and followed the child for a little while at the end of the year. So the answer is yes, they are more comprehensive, but certainly not for all patients. There's some patients you see in OBGYN clinic where it's, you see them once or whatever and but they do carry a bunch of patients longitudinally for deliveries, for example. Now, there's an important other question. Why is it such a surgery maker in some ways? That's not really longitudinal, except for maybe transplant and vascular and a handful of parts of surgery. Longitudinal and surgery, to us, meant you saw the person when no one knew if the patient did or did not need a surgery. Right? You see them at the front. Some of those patients go to surgery. You see them in the surgery. Then they end up being post-op. You see them post-op, and then you can see them in surgery if they still need stuff going on, or you can see them in medicine or wherever else they end up. Uh, these patients are sick in multiple ways. Longitudinal in surgery meant what we called a whole illness episode, pre-op, op, post-op. So that was longitudinal in surgery. If you do that with your personal surgeon for the entire year, that surgeon comes to trust you by year's end. So students get much more opportunity in surgery by year's end and actually like surgery much more. They see it much more holistically. They see the internal medicine of surgery. Thanks. I think the patient-centeredness is built into the program. I do believe. Hey, 
Hi, I'm Vanessa. I'm one of the interns here. Hi, Vanessa. Um, that was a great talk. Thank you. As sure. Someone who just finished med school. It's pretty <laughs> interesting to hear about. Um, I'm wondering, um, were the two student groups, did they rotate through the same hospitals? Great question. Or? Good job. All right. So different studies have done it differently. So in, in our study, what happened was, and you'll, I think you'll, this is it'll be fun because uh, Dan is here. In ours, the students were in one hospital, and the comparison group was in multiple hospitals. And we can, and we can pick about, what, so what does that mean? But here's why I think this is kind of a fun, a fun catch. Mass General Hospital, where Dan was, which, which I, let me just say, you were so humble yesterday, the place was changed by you, importantly. So where, where Dan did brilliant work before coming here, um, is a very prominent, very respected hospital full of brilliant residents and, edu and educators, right? So too Beth Israel, so too the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So we can suggest, I suppose, that the, the entire effect happened because they were at Cambridge, but it seems to belie a little bit of history of three of the nation's great hospitals. So could there be a hospital effect? Sure, but I'm not willing to deride those three magnificent places where my best friends all work. Um, to which somebody could say, well, yeah, you know what, though? Maybe it wasn't like the quality of your hospital. Maybe, maybe it's just that the hospital is very sort of loving and, and very supportive of students. Yeah, that, I mean, that could be it. I'm, I'm not sure how that exactly translates to learning, but let's say it were the answer. Well, in that case, I would say we have to suggest that other hospitals are somehow tr treating their students like badly or differently, which I'm also uncomfortable doing. So I, I think I'm happy to think if it were the hospital effect that you're comparing to outstanding other hospitals, but I, it's hard for me to imagine that it really was the hospital effect. Yet, I cannot exclude that. I mean, just um, not not so much in terms of outcomes, but in terms of the way students said that they felt like, oh, yes. connected to their patients. You know, with Cambridge Health Alliance being such a yes. strong advocacy and like social medicine place. Fair. I wonder if that's a big, like something we should suggest in more hospitals, maybe. Yeah. Saying, you know? So yeah, I mean, you. I mean, how how lucky is this university to have Grady and the other great hospitals, yeah. and certainly the the academic medical center um, here. Um, when you have hospitals like these, you're in this, you're kind of plush like we're like we are. But I think you're right. Maybe maybe the humanizing and, and confidence building or less marginalizing some of those adjectives could be explained by that. I think that's fair. I think the spirit of advocacy that makes sense. I think what's uplifting for me is that the other hospitals have changed their programs to have more, many more longitudinal elements as a consequence of this work. And it's in, I want to not give anything away, but it's entirely possible, maybe even likely, that the tertiary hospitals at Harvard may in fact employ models like this in the forthcoming years. But that was that was particularly great, Vanessa. So I like that. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank Hi. you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so in our first and second years uh, across the nation, Anki is a, a flashcard program that utilizes space repetition software yes. to minimize that study gap that you mentioned in your uh, talk. I was yeah. wondering if you see any role in integrating a flashcard program like that in your LA LIC. Absolutely. The answer is yes. And, and in fact, Anki would be among the ones that are used by our students. And the answer is yes. We have a guy at uh, Harvard named uh, Price Kerfoot who does a lot of research in this field and um, has sort of like whatever amount of space learning I love, Price could, could, could do it far better than I. And so it's a very strong part of the curriculum generally. It's generally held uh, within the school, uh, even apart from our program, but certainly yes, within longitudinal design programs. And I'll see you and I'll raise you one, which is that when you have the horizon of time, you can do a lot of things that are harder to do in small periods of time. So for example, if you said, we wanna do a program on like you know, quality and safety, or we want to do a program on healthcare management, or we want to do a stream, I don't know, end of life, or medical ethics, or find your thing, or on a hard science. We did this the first year. You have an entire year horizon to keep building that developmental program. You can thread it through, so, because you have the chance to space. So I strongly agree, and I strongly agree. Thank you very much. Sure. Question. Okay, I'll, I'll be back. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'll pick one of the off-site questions. Oh. Um, can you speak towards some of the educator satisfaction um, yes. within this model, specifically attendings, residents, yes. working within the clerkships? I'll, yeah, thank you for whoever asked that. I'll do a quick one on that. So the faculty are highly satisfied with the model, far more satisfied. And the, the best, uh, there's many, there are many data I could give, but here, here's one. So in the, in the original survey we did, so se yes, 72 faculty were surveyed. Uh, and the, the, the core scale was, as a consequence of teaching in this program, your work life is a lot worse, is a little worse, no change, is a little better, is a lot better. So f two people said a little worse, 
Two people said neutral, 34 said a little better, and 34 said a lot better, 68 on the positive side. So of course, since we're self-loathing, we uh, looked at the four. And, the, and we went to the four and said, like, what happened? And all four said, no, 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 you're not going to take us out of the program, are you? We can, we can teach again, please. We said, wait, wait, but you said a little worse, and you said, like, no difference. They said, no, no, it's just it was incredibly hard to imagine that we had to teach the entire canon of internal medicine ourselves, like it's all on us. So we developed a bunch of faculty development programs to help them um, sort of equilibrate what their actual role and duty was, so what didn't feel so overwhelming, and we were able to address that problem. But the data from faculty have remained like this for years and years. Like faculty do not want to leave the program, get very tense about the possibility of leaving. And frankly, what is really ridiculous is that I get criticized a lot, even by friends, for this. Dave, I want to have three students. You can't just give me one. It's ridiculous. I have three clinics I can see students, and I want three. And then they get mad if I don't give them three. While other faculty are saying, why does Peter have three? Why can't I have one? Right? So faculty are actually vying for having their students in this model. It's a huge difference to have my student versus a student. And finally, I promise, um, patients also come to the hospital and are saying, I wanted to come to this hospital because I heard you can get your own personal medical student. Right? So, <laughs> so with that, I say th thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. <laughs>